Good morning, HCC. It's good to see everybody. Um, and a warm welcome to you, whether you're here with us in the building or whether you're at home or out in the sunshine, whether it's right now or whether it's some other point in the day or even week, you're war warmly welcome to join with us this morning. I'm David and this is my wife Pauline. We're part of the eldership team here. And um, Brian um, is going to be speaking to us later this morning, um, once we can prize him off the drums. And then uh, we've got Chris and the band leading us in worship this morning. So that's going to be good. God's going to be uh, here with us, and we're looking forward to um, what he's going to do and say with us this morning. I uh, don't know about you, but I hope you're starting to have a good bank holiday. The sun's come out. Um, normally you have a bank holiday and the rain comes down but hey there we go and this Friday I managed to actually get out into the sun uh, and did some flying with my UAV I went down to God's own country which is North Yorkshire and we did some flying down there and one of the things about flying with a UAV is that you uh, you've got to keep it in line of sight you can't um, let it dodge behind buildings or anything else like that. So what do you do, tend to do as a, as a pilot is you try and find somewhere high up. And where, there was a place called Kepwick Estate, and it's just on the edge of the North York Moors, and I managed to get up a height there, and actually the views out of there were really cracking. Um, well, it's Yorkshire, so they've got to be. Um, but, I mean, you could right, see right away across to the Pennines, you could see the, the right panorama be, below you. And that's all about a physical visual line of sight, but each one of us has a spiritual line of sight. It's where we are, and I'm just going to um, read some scripture this morning, um, just before uh, Pauline prays, that actually, hopefully, he says, once I can move those out of the way, he says, realigns our uh, spiritual line of sight. Um, you probably won't need me to tell you where it's from, but I'll tell you at the end. So it says, Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, stand, standing in the center of a throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve your God, and they will reign on the earth. And then I looked and I heard the voices of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands, 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power, wealth, wisdom, and strength, and honor and glory and praise. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor, glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Oh yeah, right. As Pauline says, yes, that's Revelation 5 uh, for those that are in any doubt. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Father God, again we come before you on your day, your special day, and Lord, we pray that we would be with you just as you are with us. Help us to realign our vision so that we can see what you are doing in our lives, what you're doing in our nation, what you're doing in your world. Father, that we might express faith that you are indeed in control, that you have the ultimate vantage point. Father God, this morning again we come before you and ask for your mercy towards our nation towards our world at this time. Lord, remember all those who are still working so incredibly hard to make our world a safer place at this time, and we ask for your mercy again. We thank you for all the progress that has been made, for the technology, for the science, for the medical advances we have seen in this last time. Father, we pray that you will continue to bless us at this time. Help us to 
Renew our enthusiasm for you, for you. Renew our enthusiasm for meeting together. Renew our enthusiasm for worship, Father, this morning. And we pray that you be with us. Be in the speaking, in the praying, in the thinking, in the meditating. Father, we pray that you will be with us wherever we are. Father, in this building and beyond. Lord, we ask that your mercy towards us would be tangible to us this morning. That we know at the end of this morning that we have indeed met with the living God. And we thank you and praise you that we can know him know you for ourselves. And Lord, we just commend ourselves to your mercy at this time and ask your blessing upon us. Amen. Okay, Chris. Our God uh, calls us to worship him. So wherever we are, whether we're in HCC this morning or at home, let's welcome him to our worship. We come at his invitation and we welcome him here. Let our praise be your welcome. Let our songs be a sign. We are here for you. We are here for you. Let your breath come from heaven. Fill our hearts with your love. We are here for you. We are here for you. To you our hearts are open. Nothing here is hidden. You you, Lord. To you our hearts are open, nothing here is hidden, you are our one desire. You alone are holy, only you are worthy, God, let your fire fall down. your fire fall down. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. We praise you, praise you. 
You're welcome here. You're welcome into our homes. Lord, as we welcome you, you welcome us. You welcome us to come and follow you. There's good news for the captive. Good news for the shame. Good news for the one who walked away There's good news for the doubter For the one religion failed For the good Lord has come to seek and save Sing that again There's good news for the captive There's good news for the shame There's good news for the one who walked away Jesus, our rescuer, invites you to come to him and to follow him, to follow his plan for you. He has a plan for you. He's a leader worthy of being followed. This next song is a bit unusual. I'm going to sing it through once or twice to you as if God was singing to you. Inviting you to come to him, to come away with him, whatever he's got planned for you. And when we sing that a few times, invite you to join in as best you can, legally, if you want to, with a response, which we'll sing together. So this is God's words to you. Just 
Just focus on his presence. Come away with me. Come away with me. It's never too late. It's not too late. It's not too late for you. I have a plan for you. I have a plan for you. It's going to be wild. It's going to be great. It's going to be full of me. Open up your heart and let me in. Open up your heart and let me in. We'll sing that again. Just absorb it. Come away with me. Come away with me. It's never too late, it's not too late, it's not too late for you. Cause I have a plan for you, I have a plan for you. And it's gonna be wild, it's gonna be great, it's gonna be full of me.
We open up our hearts. What a reward awaits. Christ is my reward and all of my devotion. Now there's nothing in this world could ever satisfy through every trial my soul will sing no turning back I've been set free Christ is enough for me Christ is enough once more to make it our final prayer really of this session a declaration that Christ is enough he's my leader I'll follow him it's all settled really Christ is enough for me Christ is enough for me everything I need is in you everything I need. 
going to finish that song on that chord and it's unresolved. A musician would say that's unresolved because we're not going back to the chord we started with. Leave it hanging there as a commitment, an ongoing commitment. It's not done and dusted. Our commitment is done and dusted, but the implications of it are not. Leave it hanging there. Father, just thank you for the amazing gift that is Christ. And Father, as we've just been singing those last words, um, sometimes, Father, we just uh, have a habit of singing the words, but actually that phrase, Christ is enough for me. We sing that sometimes, Father, and we immediately go out and we start finding things to actually satisfiers that are not in you and so father we just pray that as we've sung those words and that we've taken a stand in, in a sense in what we've sung this morning that actually you will write those words into our hearts that I that actually everything everything that we need is in you there is nothing that we need that cannot be found in you and so we give you thanks for the almighty God that you are, the Father that you are, in Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, just, um, I don't know, maybe Joe and Anna will watch this at some point, but welcome back to England, Joe and Anna, wherever you are. Um, I know you're traveling around Newcastle Airport at this moment in time, but it's great to have you back in the UK. Okay, um, Brian's going to unravel himself from the drum kit and he's coming to speak to us. But before he does that, I'm just going to pray for him. Father, we just thank you for Brian. Uh, we thank you for his love for you, his uh, love of your word, his passion for the scriptures and just, um, yeah, just his ability to worship. And so, Father, we just thank you for him. We know that you've been speaking to him, and so, Father, just as he comes, we just pray that you'll give him a boldness and a courage which comes from you, a confidence which comes from you, that Christ is enough for him this morning as he speaks to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning to everyone who's here in the building, and where are all the guys? that better? Nice to see all you ladies here this morning and nice to see everyone at home. I can't see you but I know you're there. So <clears throat> today in our series of episodes from the Old Testament we're following Neil's talk last week on the early part of Joshua and we're picking up at the end of Joshua's story. As we saw on the Bible Project video last week the Israelite Israelites have parceled out the land following their victory over the Canaanites, and now Joshua is speaking to the people before he passes away, as Moses had done before him. Chapter 23, verses 14 to 16 in Joshua, they contain Joshua's address to the leaders of the nation, reminding them that God has fulfilled all his promises to them and warning them that God will only continue to do that as long as they don't turn away to other gods. So their choice is obey and be blessed or rebel and reap the disastrous consequences. Then in chapter 24, Joshua assembles them all at a place called Shechem, if that's how you pronounce it, which is where Abraham had met with God in Genesis chapter 12. Abraham built an altar there, and Jacob, in Genesis chapter 35, had buried foreign gods under an oak tree there. Joshua's encouragement for his people here is the same. Get rid of any foreign gods and serve the Lord only. Joshua recites for them the history of their nation up to then, using the first person for God speaking to them. So... I delivered you from the Egyptians and I brought you to this land. And he sets out God's calling on the nation and God's grace. And then he says, Now fear the Lord 
and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your ancestors worshipped beyond the river Euphrates and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. So first Joshua says, choose whom you will serve, the Lord or some other god of other nations, and then he nails his colours to the mast. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. I noticed on the um, children's activities, there were lots of houses to colour in. I'm not sure what that was to do with this passage. I understand why they were there, but this, where it says house, it means household. It's not the building, it's all the people who were with him. So then the people say, we will serve the Lord too. And Joshua checks with them a couple of times to make sure they're serious. And then comes the making of a solemn covenant, which is recorded in writing and by setting up a large stone under the same oak tree, which was regarded as a holy place. So what has this ancient ceremony that took place over 3,000 years ago to do with us here today in 21st century Hexham. It's like a marriage ceremony when the participants take solemn vows of faithfulness to each other for the rest of their lives. In this case, one of the parties to the agreement is God and he will remain faithful forever, as we see in the rest of scripture. Of all the world religions, only the God of Israel is a covenant-keeping God. He's made several covenants in the Bible with Noah, Abraham, Moses, and others. And because of his covenant, we can fully put our trust in him. His latest covenant with us was made by Jesus, who said at his last meal with his followers, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. So God is the same today as he was for Joshua. And we are all human, no different to Joshua and his nation. We might have smartphones and smart watches and smart TVs and smart everything else. But as people, we haven't changed much. We're very similar to Joshua's people. So we can see that essentially we have the same choice as they did to follow God or not. So that was all the introduction. (laughs) I've got three points. First point, you have to follow somebody. Second point, what is our choice? And third point, when do we get to choose? So to understand our position before God, we have to go way back to the beginning in Genesis. Genesis means beginnings. It tells us that we were created in God's image. So what does that mean? Well, God's a trinity of three persons. It's Trinity Sunday today, if you didn't know, but it is. So the trinity is in perfect relationship one with another, showing mutual love and honor, including obedience of the Son to the Father. When Jesus became a man, as well as being God, he showed us what it looks like to lead a perfect life in obedience to the Father God. That's what God intended for us in the beginning. Genesis tells us that we were originally given freedom to live in relationship with God, but there was one stipulation, don't eat from one tree. Adam failed that test, and as a result, all humanity became subject to the consequences, which included death, and a propensity to think, I know best. I hope you can recognize that that accurately describes our condition. I know that applies to me. So later in Genesis, we read that God chose one man, Abraham, from whose descendants, the nation of Israel, would come God's solution to put things right. And that came through Jesus. Through Moses, God gave the people ways to fix things temporarily using rules they had to follow to show that they were different from other nations including sacrificing animals to deal with their sin. 
their separation from God and their selfishness. And that's the situation Joshua's people were in. In the beginning then, we humans were made to serve or worship God. And so by our very nature, we must worship something or somebody. Unfortunately, as I described earlier, we're predisposed to worshiping ourselves, to thinking that we have it all sorted and can manage very well on our own, thank you. Independence is held up today by many as a virtue, but in God's eyes, it's the height of pride and it's really offensive to him. In the account of the beginning, in Genesis chapter three, it was our enemy, Satan, who derailed the human race. And since then, our nature is no longer to live in the world of God's provision in perfect submission to him, but instead to think that we know the difference between what's good and what isn't, and to set ourselves up as the arbiter of things in place of God. We can see in our news every day the mess people are making of things through such belief as they start wars, commit crimes, and reject God's created order. Throughout human history, since the beginning, mankind in his selfishness has looked to an amazing array of gods as a kind of insurance policy. They could supposedly deliver things that man couldn't, like good harvests and so on. Most of these gods were invented by human ingenuity. And you can see that throughout the Old Testament, including in Psalm 115, where it says, Their idols are silver and gold made by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear, noses but cannot smell. They have hands but cannot feel, feet but cannot walk, nor can they utter a sound with their throats. Those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. So... What about our modern idols today? Which are your favorite gods apart from the Lord? That brings me on to my second point. What is our choice? And I need to spell this out as much for myself as for you. So you can be in one of two situations. Are you in trouble? Then you may think that science, in the guise of the NHS, or good fortune, as offered by betting websites or the National Lottery, or your best way out of trouble. I'm not decrying the excellent work of the NHS, because that can bring us much relief and improvement. But I'm reminding us that it doesn't have the full solution. Many medical problems currently have no cure at all. And some treatments are still fairly crude, and in some ways nearly as unpleasant as the diseases they're designed to treat. Only God's healing touch restores us to perfect health. So when we reach for the paracetamol or call 111, let's remember to pray as well as doing either of those things. And if you're in financial need, don't look for a lucky break to get you out of your problem. That might only be a temporary fix if you haven't learned how to manage your finances well. Look to God and he will show you how to manage your money to be content with what you already have and to be generous with what he's generously given to you. Then he'll begin to bless you with financial provision. Let's live our lives in God's grace, letting him know that he's sovereign, that he is sovereign, and we are grateful for his provision. He knows that already, of course. The prayer of thanks is for our benefit, not his. Place yourselves in God's hands and you won't regret it. Like Joshua's nation, God will fight for you, but you have to surrender to him first and obey what he tells you to do. The second situation you can be in is that everything's going great for you. You're fitting well and you have everything you need. That's great. But don't congratulate yourself because it has very little to do with what you've done. It's a gift from God. And in fact, everything you have belongs to him. He's entrusted it to you to enjoy and to use on his behalf. And tomorrow that could all change. 
So our joy isn't dependent on our good circumstances, but on our relationship with the living God who will never change. So, no matter who you are or what your situation is, you have a choice. You can follow the Lord. His way might be tough in some ways, and you should consider the cost before deciding to take it on. It might cost you everything you have, like the young man who Jesus told to sell everything he had and give it away. But we know that Jesus has already given up everything he had to come and save us. And that's immeasurably more than anything we could ever have. If you don't know about that, just read the first 11 verses of Philippians chapter 2. But there's no other way. As Peter responded when Jesus saw people being put off and drifting away, Jesus said to his close followers, you don't want to leave too, do you? Peter replied, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. There is no other way. There's no one else who we can serve who will be good for us. You can serve the false gods of self-sufficiency and self-importance, wanting even better and even more expensive things. Or you can serve the living God who wants the very best for you and who will never let you down. If, like Jesus, you humble yourself and pour out your life in service for him, then he'll raise you up and honor you. Remember that in God's kingdom, the way up is down, and the way to be honored is to recognize him as Lord and humble yourself before him. If you don't know this, go back to the first 11 verses of Philippians chapter 2. If you've submitted your life to Jesus, you have a great privilege to be adopted as God's son or daughter along with Jesus. But it's not to a life of privilege and luxury. He calls us to undergo hardships and trials for the purpose of extending his kingdom, like a beautiful flower being pruned to produce better blossoms or a tree being pruned so as to produce more fruit. So that brings us to my final point. When do we get to choose? And I want to talk first to those people who already follow Jesus. You still have a choice, so don't sit back and think, I've already made my choice. For you, the choice is right now and every moment of every day. Yes, you've already decided to follow Jesus, but at any time you could bail out and take control again. I don't know which is more difficult to live in a society where we can give assent to follow Jesus, yes, I believe all that, and then not let it affect our lives, what's known as practical atheism. And I can look back on my life and see that there have been times when that's what I was doing. Or to be in a society that persecutes its believers. At least if we did live in such a place, we would be forced to make a choice. In our society, we can pretend to choose Jesus, but it can make little difference to the way we live. So let's keep on pressing on and not become weary in doing good, as Paul says. Because as he goes on to say, at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. So don't stop going around the walls on the sixth day. Keep going. These can sometimes be deep and difficult things for us to achieve. But if we're born again, thanks to Jesus, we have Holy Spirit to help us. So every day when you have that decision to make, who will you choose today? Ask Holy Spirit to fill you and to help you to follow Jesus. And remember, it's more about being in relationship with Jesus than doing all the right things, wanting to please him rather than having a huge list of do's and don'ts. So we get to follow him and do those things, not we have to do those things. And I want to emphasize it's every day we have to choose to follow Jesus. I want to talk now to those people who don't already follow Jesus. For you, the choice is also right now, but for the first time. The people in the passage we read about were asked by Joshua, choose who you will follow. But for us, it's slightly different. 
We're in a better position than Joshua's people because we know about Jesus and we aren't just following rules. Jesus is asking you to make a choice. Will you follow him or are you determined to keep on going your own way? And incidentally, how has that worked out for you so far? In some ways, it's a stark choice. Either accept that you can't put your own life right, that Jesus has offered himself as a sacrifice for you and choose to follow Jesus' way. Or remain enslaved to those things that promise much but deliver little. They might give you temporary relief, but that doesn't last. The people who followed Joshua were tempted by the gods that other nations worshipped. They were supposed to protect them and make them successful. For us, that probably translates into things like money and status and power. But beware, because no matter how much you have, somebody always has more. <clears throat> and you have to work incredibly hard to keep what you have from being stolen or devalued, unless you trust God to provide for you. If you want to choose to follow Jesus, you can't do it in your own strength. You need first to give your life to him and he will transform you and make you spiritually alive to him. When we give our lives over to his direction, he sets us free to follow him. So, we're nearly at the end now. Whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, choose today to go Jesus' way. Be open to God speaking to you about his kingdom and all its benefits. Don't worry about things you've done wrong or whether you're good enough. Jesus has taken care of all that. He just wants you to say, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life and to choose to follow him. Or in the words of our passage, choose whom you will serve. And I hope your response every day will be, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. If you would like to get to know the Jesus who I know and who I've been talking about this morning, even if you've done things wrong or you think you can never be good enough, then we'd love to talk to you about these things. So do get in touch either through the church's web page or the Facebook page or at the community grocery shop, but not tomorrow because it's closed. Also, we would like to pray for you if you need God's help either about what I've spoken just now or anything else, except this week there won't be any online prayer. So if you would like to receive prayer, you'll also have to contact us in one of the same ways. Thank you.
stuff in there to think about and just as uh, I was listening to Brian uh, God, God is amazing God when he created us he created us with free will that was a very risky thing that he did because that means as Brian has quite extensively pointed out we have choices and the choices are our choices and only we can do that and the choice to follow him is ours and the choice, whether it's the first time or whether it's when we make up in the morning, is ours. So, lots of things in there. Thank you, Brian, for that. Um, so, um, I'm just going to hand over to Pauline. She's got a few notices, and then we'll close in prayer. Yeah, notice singular. There is, unfortunately, no prayer time after the meeting this morning. There's no online prayer time this week. Um, but... Um, it will resume as usual next week. And if you do need prayer, uh, if you're a member of the congregation, please contact somebody in the leadership team or your uh, family group leader if that's uh, what you need at this time. All those people will be very happy to pray with you. There's no meeting on Tuesday night, but we'll be back here next Sunday morning at 10.30, either virtually or in the flesh. Okay? Uh, and everybody's very welcome to join with us then. Shall we just pray together? Would everybody here who's with us like to stand as we join together? Something we can do? And we'll just pray. Father God, I just thank you and praise you for our time together. Our time together on your day. Our time together in your presence. And Father, I pray now that as we have been reminded, we would acknowledge that presence with us as we go out from this place. It would be the deciding factor in the way we conduct our lives in the way we conduct our relationships, and that our mind would be renewed by knowing that you are with us throughout today and this week. And we just give you praise and glory that that is a truth that we can depend on, a truth that we can live our lives by. And as we leave this place, Father, I pray that we might have a sense of that presence, and we're just so thankful and grateful that your Son made that possible for us by your Spirit. Amen.